I don't know if I want to say like the, all the stuff that happens or how to where it won't change the way like people look at you. I don't want them to see me as Oh my God, I'm so sorry, you're so strong, that's incredible. I don't want those words at all. I'm not strong. I just lived my life, my only thing I knew. Every single person has a story and there are so many layers to all of us and everyone has been dealt their own cards of shit that they had to play out. I just don't want people's perception of me to change because they feel pity. Bursting to the finish line, and she's a first time gold medal winner at the Paralympic Games. Who, me? Yeah. No, I didn't. Oh my god, fat big candy cane. Oh my goodness, it's awfully big. It's so crunchy. Oh, scrunchies, yay. Oh, look at that. Kathy, yeah, you know I ice skate. Oh, he knows everything, Oksana. Mishka, Mishka. I started getting interested in adoption in about maybe 1989. I had a, a lot of people thought I shouldn't adopt at all, like I shouldn't be a single mom. It was just a grainy black and white photo from an, a little news article from an adoption agency. I looked at the birth date, it was a day before she was going to turn five. I said, but she's not a baby. And I spent the whole weekend agonizing. But it was her eyes. They just pull you in. And I knew that she just was my kid. The director of the orphanage is like, Oksana, I have to tell you something. Um, he's like, you're, you're gonna have a mom. There's someone who's gonna come and adopt you. And there's specific families that I remember that said they were gonna come and give you like a home and they're gonna be in your family, but then they don't come back. I did the paperwork so fast. And then she had to tell me the truth that I couldn't get her because Ukraine just shut down all adoptions for a little over two years, so. So I didn't understand what was going on and why she wasn't coming. The director of the orphanage would be like, well, see, Oksana, this is why your mom's not coming because you're a bad girl and nobody wants a bad girl. Obviously, like the first couple times, I didn't believe that. But then when it's a year in and she's not there, you kind of start to wonder like, and I just didn't want it to be like another lie. And my agency kept, um, they said, you should just go to Russia and get a baby. Like you could go tomorrow. And I was like, I have my child, she's in Ukraine. I had pictures of her, so I, I shopped it to orthopedic surgeons, and that's where they said, you know, she, you know she's going to have to have both legs amputated. No, no big deal. We can handle that. She fought for me for two years. I very faintly in my dream hear, like, footsteps and whispers, but then it, it turned out to be not a dream because then somebody says, drop, like kneels down to my bed and is like, Oksana, your mom's here to meet you. She looked at me and she goes, I know you, you're my mother, I have a picture, see? And she went to her bedside table and she took my passport photo out that they had given her. And then I just said something equally lame, like, I know you too, I have your picture too. I remember she picked out an outfit for me I looked at it and rearranged the whole entire outfit. And I think that was like the first warning sign for my mom to be like, oh dear Lord, 
I have an independent, opinionated woman on my hands. Mm -hmm. What did I get myself into? She said she was worried about two things, flying across the ocean and having to learn English. And she said, but I'm a smart girl. I'm not going to learn English. I'm going to teach my mother Ukrainian. When we arrived in America, she grew eight inches in six months. Yeah, so it was sort of like, wow, look what food and love can do. I think she was scared a lot of the times, but that's one thing that she learned never to show. I think it was about a year, first time she cried. I think she finally felt free enough to cry that I wasn't going to think that she was weak. Nobody was going to beat her up. Nobody was going to say, what's wrong with you, you stupid girl. Um, all the things that I think happen in the orphanage. A lot of people don't want to believe what happens in orphanages and a lot of times things are okay and things happen and are looked the other way because these kids don't have families. They don't care. They don't care. They're throwaways. They're rejected. No one's going to know what's happening to them. One of the things I struggled with when I came to America was sleeping. A normal kid can't sleep. If their teddy bear or their favorite blanket isn't there, they can't sleep. I didn't get to live a normal kid life. When I would sleep in Ukraine, I hated it. it. A lot of horrible things would happen at night. I would always draw this like room with two beds, one on the side, one on the side, and the door wide open, and like a shadow of this dark, dark person. I think I was just drawing what was my every night, what was my normalcy of somebody who was, yeah, just being raped every single day from five to seven, from when I was five to seven. And um, it turns out that that orphanage, they were running a brothel into it too. So they were, it's really, um, like that orphanage basically like, I'm just lucky I got alive, got out of there alive because could have went down under, underground into a system where like your existence never even was there. Like no one would ever know. She didn't talk about a lot of stuff at the beginning. Um, and she said she didn't remember and I don't know if she didn't remember um, or just didn't want to tell me. So many lies and hurt and pain and anger, especially being one of two girls, especially after my friend Lainey wasn't there anymore. She, it's, oh man. Um... Apparently she and, and Lainey had uh, snuck out, they were hungry. And together, those two girls used to sneak out of their bed and go steal bread from the kitchen. She took the brunt of a lot of abuse for me. And they got caught. They ran, and apparently they hid under a table, from what she says. And Oksana says, I hid a chair, and it made noise. And so they got Lainey, and they beat her. So, um... And they told her, you'll be next. Basically, that was the last time I ever saw her. And she ended up passing away at night. That was the last time I saw what only thing I knew of a family was. She definitely would have been a gift in this world for sure if she was still here. It's not fair that there's so many kids, she's not the only one, there's so many kids that don't get the chance to live out, live their life. I hope that she's happy with how I've chosen to live life instead of um, 
settle in that dark life and just have like feel pity for everything and just celebrate life and what it has to offer rather than rather than just ha like be angry and miserable which she would probably be supportive of that too it's like he'd have a right to be pretty angry hmm. okay hello my my, my mom being goofy but this is for Santa I had my childhood. It was just a little bit delayed. She just got an empathy that I don't think you can teach. She just has always had it. I just thought I was the luckiest kid on earth. Like my mom really quickly had to realize she had to start checking my friend's pockets. I thought I was the only one in the US that had all those toys. I thought all those kids were like me and never had toys. Yeah! And so I was like, oh my God, I have so many. And so I started giving away my toys to them. What's crazy is in Ukraine, I didn't know I was different or disabled. I guess I knew a little bit because I didn't look the same. I, I had six toes, which I thought that was the coolest thing on earth. And I had both of my legs but I was missing the whole weight-bearing bone on both legs. It was some kind of radiation exposure. Could have been a food, it could have been a nuclear power plant leak. I don't, we don't really know. You know, it was really interesting when she was little, like she didn't try to hide her prosthetics. And then she got to middle school and she just hid her legs all the time. I think a lot of it was just being a teenager where you don't want to be different at all. We're all different, but her difference was so big. Oh, this is the, oh, this is my mommy. Oh, oh, this is my mommy. Oh, I can't stand it. And then got, got to leave. So goodbye for now. Bye. Have a nice weekend. I learned early on not, not to say you can't do that. I put her in every sport she was willing to try. Somebody said, like, you should, there's an adapted rowing program, you should try that. I didn't want to do it because they said it was adapted. And I'm like, well, just because I'm missing my leg doesn't mean I'm going to do an adapted special sport. My mom was like, just go and try it, just try it, you'll never know. Like, it's just one Saturday, can you just please do this for me and then I'll stop asking you. I pushed off from the dock and the boat and the oars are floating and you're just out there on the water and you're controlling what you're doing with your hands. That moment is kind of where that fire was lit. Next thing you know, it turned into the Paralympics. <laughs> Get that helmet on, girl! Woo! China Masters is making light work of a course. I hate when people ask, like, what's your favorite sport? It's like asking a mom, which one's your favorite kid? During that time, like, I love that feeling, that release I get. It's literally my way to scream physically, but silently. It's amazing how your brain will just, when it wants to forget something and won't remember certain things. What's crazy is my mind is so controlled, but my body has these reactions from things that were done to me and memories and sometimes I don't even remember something until my body's gone through this reaction and I'm like, a memory is triggered and then I go straight back to that day and black out and forget, am I in Ukraine or am I here in America? 
I hate knives. I hate the sound of a knife. I hate the sound of a flip knife when the button pushes and the knife flips up. And there's one specific incident that I was um, the first time that it ever, ever happened. Basically, I was moving around too much, and so somebody just had a knife on them and took it out and leaned down and pushed it into me just too much. It took me forever to look in the mirror and not hate myself and realize that was something that I had no control over. I didn't ask for it. I didn't, like, I don't know why. I don't know why women have to feel so disgusted and so ashamed of something and why I feel like that. To come with like scars that the story's almost been written for you and some you don't even know the story but it's there and you're discovering it for the first time. It says a rose is still and always will be a rose because no matter like how ugly you feel about yourself or how much you hate your body or how much you hate your memories and just to look at yourself as still worthy of love and everything else despite how ugly things happen to you. At the end of the day, it's still a rose. It doesn't matter which form it is. If I was listening to my friend talk right now and say these stories, I would tell them like, there's so much therapy in talking and letting it out in that you have no idea who is going to have a similar story and is terrified just as you are to share something, and but can all of a sudden have someone they can connect to and bond to because they know exactly what you went through. But it's another thing to actually all of a sudden when you think about the people that you know, like my boyfriend, my boyfriend's family, my coaches, like everybody who follows my sports and my career, it's definitely, I just don't want people's perception of me to change because they feel pity instead of like, I want people's perception of me to like, when they first, just like my, my prosthetics, when people look at me, they see, I don't want them to see this first. Every single person has a story, and there are so many layers to all of us, and everyone has been dealt their own cards of shit that they had to play out. That's the beauty of the shit that happened in Ukraine. I like to think of it as a secret weapon I have. Like, I felt so much worse. And then when I do think about letting myself stop, I go to Lainey, or I go to just my days in the orphanage, and then all of a sudden I feel like it's like the starting of a new race, and I just feel more power. Or I didn't get in sports to like win everything. It was therapy for me. I was getting stronger, healthier. I was learning to accept myself and love myself and seeing strength within myself I had no idea I could have after all of a sudden my legs are gone. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much to the number one person in my entire life, mom. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for saving me, giving me a second opportunity at life, and for opening the doors of sports and waiting for me until I was ready to walk through that door. And um, to any girl or boy, no matter what age, if you guys look different or if you think you look different, to never let society determine what you see when you look in the mirror and to never let them determine the preconceived notions of what they think is possible and 
yourself. So go for it. Thank you. I think, like, if I could say something to my seven-year-old self, I would say, don't change a thing. But keep on fighting. It's gonna get easier. <laughs> Life's gonna get a lot easier. This is not your forever. This moment's not your forever.